back all you joygasmers to joygasm a video game and movie podcast i'm russ he is steve and we want to wish each and every one of you a very merry christmas and a happy new year in episode 301 today december 30th 2022 we're gonna be getting right into our topic of the day which is avatar the way of water so there's no need to fast forward whatsoever. But before we get into the nitty gritty, be sure that you uh, clone that subscribe button and um, bond with that notification bell. That way you will not miss a single solitary episode of Joygasm that drops once a week each week. Steve, this has been a film that has been in production for a about 13 years now. The first film came out way back. And I want to say it was like around 2008, Nine. 2009. Right yeah. Right yeah. Indeed, Steve. Indeed. And so mm. a lot of people have been wondering, including us, about how this film would fare, mm. considering the fact that the first film broke all kinds of records. It became the highest grossing film of all time and kept mm. that record, I think, until Avengers. It was either Avengers Infinity War or Avengers uh, Endgame. Mm. Something around that. But uh, but now here we are. It has come out. It has released. And, uh, oh, just FYI, we are going to be talking about spoilers. So consider this your spoiler alert. But Steve, please uh, tell me, and as well as all of them, hmm. what did you think of the movie? Russ, um, I know that face. Uh, I went into this one with low expectations. I could understand that. I was not a big fan of the first one. Actually, I really don't understand why I made so much money. Well, I, I understand a little bit. <laughs> um, I mean, it was a, a techno fest by a large scale. Like, you know, n no one ever seen anything like it, especially with all the CG stuff. I mean, everyone was wowed with the, the forest jellyfish that were 3D coming out of you. You know, I, so it was a technical marvel. It was. Um, but that's really the long and short of it. Mm. Because after that, the story, to me, at least in my opinion, uh, it really fell flat. What this about was, the fat and skinny of it, Steve? Um, that too. <laughs> Russ. Now, uh, the short and stubby oh. is <laughs> this, this, the first movie stood out in my mind as like the one movie where all I wanted to do was go in and have a good time, set my brain at the door, put it in a park and just veg out and have a wonderful time. And this movie like took itself way too seriously. And every time I went like, no, I don't want to think about environmental issues. I don't want to be lectured at, you know, just leave me alone. Just entertain me. It was like, no, no, you're going to be sitting through this. It's going to be like, you're either black or white. Da, da, da. I'm like, ah. and like, I couldn't just be entertained. Uh huh. That's how I walked away from the first movie. So this one, I think mm, that was from the first movie. That was the first movie. Oh, so that's where the bar that, that, and that movie just stands out in my head. Like just, mm, I, Stands apart, Russ. <laughs> so walking into this movie, that's the last impression I had uh -huh. going into this movie. Like, I'm going to get the same thing all over again. Mm. And I kind of did, mm -hmm. Russ. Um, the movie seemed to be kind of more of um, James Cameron's ego fest, in my opinion. Really? than making something, you know, beautiful and artistic and something that uh, people will long remember other than just special effects. Um, and it comes with a lot of stuff that he's said about other film, like a lot of shade he's been throwing. Oh. Like if you, uh, like a lot of the, the, the Marvel films, and you were talking about Endgame. Well, it was around Endgame when James Cameron was saying, oh, the, those movies, you know, they're not really movies. Uh, you know, the special effects, people in capes, eh, there's nothing really to be said for that. He's like, I'm not going to say anything bad, but I'm going to say something bad. And it happened like twice. And people are like, James, what, like, get off it. 
And then he was going like, if you didn't like his Terminator movie, like the la- later one, he was like, oh, well, you're just a toxic male if you don't like it. You're like, what? Jay? No, I I just didn't care for the, you know, and so there, or even like if you didn't like Avatar, there's, 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 um, he, there's video out there of him walking out and people are like, Hey James, how you doing? How you doing? He just like rushes past his fans. And then people are like, Hey James, you want to sign anything? He's like, no, and he gets in his vehicle and he goes, so avatar sucks then. And he like rolls down his window and flips off all the fans. Like we, you were making the movie for us. It sounds like you've got so a lot of pent up issues. You here, get Steve. paid James. Well, it's, it's like, but you watch the film like that wouldn't that doesn't doesn't make any sense for him to do that and be like in the entertainment industry and appreciate all art. And then you watch something like Avatar and you're like, yeah, this is just his ego fest that I'm watching. It's so like self gratifying or, or or like bloated in its own satisfaction that it just it's it's too much of whatever it, it, it is. <laughs> You know, like it, there, there's way too much celebration of Avatar as a thing than actual storytelling. And I found myself in the theaters getting exhausted. Like I just wanted to leave. I wanted to leave and then think, I, I thought either they should bring in David Attenborough <laughs> so he could say, well, the Naviet tribe of the water continent, you know, he could come in like BBC or you know, planet earth or something. And tell, that would have been way more entertaining to me mm-hmm. um, than, than what we saw. That being said, um, <laughs> <laughs> after I crapped all over everything, yeah, happily crapped all over everything. I, I did like the movie <laughs> slightly better than I did uh, the first one. And that's saying, saying a lot, though. I just, I I don't know. The movie is raking in the bucks, and I think people are desperate for Hollywood to really bring out something good. Because this whole year hasn't really been a good year for many good movies. Mm. You know what I mean? So that might be one of the reasons why. But I really um, didn't care for it. Uh, there's, there's a character in there who's just a complete throwaway the story was just fell flat. I, I don't know. I just, there's, I would have to hunt and peck for good stuff. Mm. Let me put it that way. In my opinion, then they just like, Oh, it was 50, 50. No, I, I <laughs> the bad far outweighed the good for me. I see Steve. I, I see. will say like people who enjoyed the first film, I'm sure they enjoyed this film. I didn't enjoy the last <laughs> film, and I didn't enjoy this one, Russ. Uh, I think you've made that clear, Steve. Just mm. wanted to make sure that was driven home, Russ. Yeah, <sighs> that one out of the park. Sure. We'll yeah. Go with that, Steve. Go with that, Steve. Mm. The first film that came out was, in fact, a technical marvel. Mm. It was a return, a triumphant return to the 3D movies. I remember that actually mm. very vividly. Just yeah. because Hollywood had steered away. They, they used to do kind of like these little dabblings in, in 3D, like, you know, back in the, the 60s, for example. Like, they would play around with some of the, like, 3D glasses you could wear. But I mean, they didn't obviously have the same technology as they did when they came out with the first Avatar film. That actually, I think, was a big draw because, if you recall, it came out on IMAX, hmm. which, back in 2009, you really didn't have very many, like, actual Hollywood movies coming out back then it was still predominantly more of like the science kind of shows or, you know, like, let's see what NASA's doing, you know, that sort of thing. But not so much. Did you see like a, an inter- entertaining blockbuster use IMAX? Mm. I mean, to give you an idea, like Christopher Nolan didn't start using uh, IMAX in his films until Batman, the dark Knight, which that film didn't even come out until I want to say 2012. And even then he was only used, he only used it in like certain scenes. It wasn't even the entire movie. So that gives you an idea of like what was going on. So I think what happened was, is that James Cameron identified an opportunity in the sense that first of all, he was going to do it on IMAX. He shot the film on in IMAX. And that was just that, that really helps to usher in IMAX as like a standard for like future Hollywood movies. And then the second thing was the 3d in the sense that, they didn't just like shoot the film and then later on decide, oh, let's put in like some post-processing or whatever for the film. Mm. They actually from the ground up designed like a whole production pipeline that was geared toward how you do the 3D. What was interesting though was that after the huge success of the first Avatar film, 
you had a bunch of other movie studios who wanted to get in on the trend, on the fad. And so th- what they would do is they did like a really like cheap slapstick version where like th- the films they had did not use the same techniques of like, of like building the movie from the ground up to really take advantage of the 3D technology. Instead, they did the bare minimum. And that's why like a lot of films that came out afterwards that says, hey, we're 3D. And you go and you watch, you're like, this doesn't look as good for some reason. Like you went to Avatar, you watched that movie. I mean, it, the 3D was quality. Like you were just like, wow, this is, this is really something. And of course, you know, all the other frosted blonde tipped bros out there who saw like this cheap opportunity to try and make it a quick buck ended up spoiling <laughs> it for everybody else. <laughs> um, but yeah, like when it came to the story, the story itself was nothing of, you know, uh, novelty or whatever. I mean, we, we were even kind of joking around how it's dances with Smurfs. You know, you have like people coming in and then there are some kind of indigenous tribe and, and there's all the, you know some kind of war that's going on. Pocahontas meets Fern Gully. A little, yeah, a little bit of that. Um, and so it was predom- like for me, it was predominantly more of a visual tour de force. Like I, I as a, a visual creative, found myself appreciating like the the bar that they had set. I mean, like, again, 2009 and the, the, the type of CG that you saw in there was just mind blowing. I remember that was a big deal. But again, like even for myself, like when I look at the catalog of James Cameron films that he has done over the decades, Avatar is not at the top for me. You know, like, like I, I absolutely love aliens. I love Titanic. I love Terminator two. There, there are earlier stuff. Yeah. Kind of the earlier stuff, but I mean, true lies. Yeah. True lies was a lot of fun. So I mean, like when I think of that, like there are a number of different James Karen films that I have thoroughly enjoyed that I really do like. I mean, I, I view him as a very talented director, but again, the story itself was just kind of like, well, you know, I think there were certain missed opportunities that honestly, a couple of which got revisited in the sequel. So speaking of the sequel, the sequel itself, of course, you know, it's bigger, you know, visually better, larger, that sort of thing. You can tell that like, you know, since 2009, 13 years really gives you a you know, kind of a nice little visual boost. And actually I was reading about how the, one of the main reasons why they waited so long was because James actually wanted to have the sequel be predominantly underwater. Ah. One of the biggest challenges, and, and I've told you this since I was like in college, one of the hardest things to do in CG is water. Animate. Yeah, I've, I've, you have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea, but I've known it's been difficult to animate because I've mentioned that on plenty of games. Like the water just kind of goes, Ugh, yeah, Ugh, sort of thing. It doesn't like curl and crash and, you know, mist out. It just doesn't do, it just looks like kind of liquid jello in a way. Yeah. It depends on, on, on what game you're playing. Um, they definitely look water looks better in films just because they have more bandwidth to be able to basically compute those mathematically intensive algorithms to make the water look better. So in this instance, like when we're watching avatar, the way of water, like Mm. all the different underwater scenes. And like, for instance, like in my opinion, the underwater sequences, as well as even the, like the forest scenes, basically every scene in this movie is absolutely gorgeous. Like you look at it and it's just, it, I found myself, if, if the avatar design wasn't so stylized, Mm. And it's presentation, you know, because like it has like kind of like elongated limbs and like the torso is elongated. It's clearly like a stylized thing. So you can't help but think like, okay, because these creatures don't actually exist. They just they it has like the mark of CG on them. But having said that, like looking at how they existed in their habitat, in their environments and that sort of thing, I thought it was absolutely beautiful. It, it, again, it's another technical merit in terms of what they were able to create. One of the issues though that I have is similar to like what you were talking about where um, in the second film, it's it, it kind of continued on down this path of like, um, for instance, the, the, the I, I'll just call them the whalers, right? You know, like, like there are certain scenes where they're hunting down this like alien species. I don't know what the name of the species of creature it is, but it's basically like a whale. And they're hunting them because they can extract this golden ooze from like their, their 
cerebral cortex or yeah. something that's worth $80 million back on earth or whatever. Right. And so it's like, you see that and it's like, okay, well that, you know, and, and they made it clear that they don't even like use anything else from the animal. And these, this is a huge whale sized animal. It's a waste, right? It's all greed. And I can get behind that to a certain extent just because like on earth and in real world, um, you know, you have certain types of uh, whale species that are endangered, right? Sure. That like, you know, if you look at how there are in fact certain countries in the world that go on these illegal whaling expeditions and they're really, they're doing something that's very similar in the sense where like they'll take some dinky little thing that they need from the whale and then not even do anything else with the whale itself. There have even been international um, treaties and sure. laws created as a result of that. Right. So it's like, I don't have a problem with that. And it's like, okay, well that that's something there. And I liked how that it was kind of like a mini journey within the overall journey itself. I liked how that kind of came full circle. However, the thing that, that like was, you know, kind of like a, a continuation is this notion of colonization, right? So in the first avatar movie, they were talking about how the reason why they were there is because of that, that one type of material called, called unobtainium. Unobtainium. Can't <laughs> think of anything more creative than that. It's hard to find him. <laughs> hard, hard to find him. Oh that was gosh. good. So like, you know, that, that was like totally cheesy and everything else. But the premise behind it was that, okay, this is a brand new material that, that is obviously not a part of earth. They can bring it back to earth because it's super valuable. It, it can be used in all these different types of uh, applications, that sort of thing. In the second film, we learn that actually Earth is dying. Hmm. Do, you, do you recall that scene where, you know, you have the um, the colonel that comes back, like basically like he his memories and, and personality have been downloaded into this new avatar that kind of looks like him. So he's getting the 411 from the female general. And she was basically letting him know, hey, the reason why we've built such a like this huge city thing is basically that the... the Earth as a planet is dying. It's running out of resources and essentially humanity is going to have to move to Pandora. So that's a big like, whoa, okay. So now that introduces like a brand new situation. The thing that I wish that, that James would have done in this film is to actually show it, uh, not all of it, but like have a significant portion of the film show it from humanity's perspective, right? You know, if your planet is dying, if, if you know your your food supply, your natural resources, whatever it may be, is being quickly used up and there is no replacement. And so there's a sense of desperation. How does that then plug into and work with Pandora and the natives that, that live sure. on Pandora? Like, I think that that would actually be a very compelling narrative to tell in this movie because, you know, he spent so much time with the like the to the two different types of tribes right you had like kind of the forest tribe and then you had the the water tribe which was cool like i really liked getting to know like the like i thought the water chieftain was a cool character his wife was kind of cool too and um but the thing is is that he winds up vilifying most of humanity with Correct. the exception of like a few key characters that are allies of the a Navi. couple of scientists yeah yeah exactly but, you know, that becomes one dimensional in a sense where like, you know, OK, we're going to simplify the story down. We're going to boil it down to basically the alien species are, are our, our protagonists mm -hmm. and most of the humans are the antagonists. And I just thought, you know, I feel as though that is a bit of a missed opportunity because how neat would it be to actually show both sides of the story in a sense where maybe there are a few bad apples on both sides but at the same time, like have the audience kind of be in the, this mode of conflict themselves where it subverts expectations. And like, if you go into an avatar movie and you're thinking, Oh, well, I'm just gonna, you know, obviously I'm going to be rooting for the, the, you know, the, the avatar protagonists or whatever. And then all of a sudden they flip the script on the audience to the point where the audience is like, man, I don't know who to vote for because or root for just because, both sides have these very like real concerns, real issues, that sort of thing. How is this going to play itself out? Right. I think the three and a half hours that we were sitting in the theater would have been much more riveting as a result. What's that you, Steve? 
I agree, Russ. Oh! And so, but you have that, everything you just said, it's multiplied by two because you take what happened in the first film and like if you're a human uh, and not a scientist, like everybody else is just militaristic and violent and we're coming here and I don't get out of our way, we're gonna run them over. You know, <laughs> oh, blast that out of the sky, blast that out of, you know, like, and so that's the only representation you see as a human. Yeah. And, when you're walking around day to day in your life, like people just don't talk like that. People don't think like that. Um, well, I have to interject really quick. One of the tropes that both my wife and I noticed is that why is it that in these movies, the, the, the evil humans all have a Southern accent. Like, what's that about? Like you, you gotta do it for me, son. Yeah. <laughs> you know, back in Kentucky, we took care of our own. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that like there are many other Americans in the military that are not just from the South. <laughs> it's because the Southerners have the cojones <laughs> to fly out into space. I guess every one of them Southern folk <laughs> love to just take on over everything. Them aliens, you ain't welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh. I mean, so, so that was something that was also an observation where I'm just like, okay, this is such a trope. Like, can we please broaden the, the uh, number of like antagonists in here? It's, you can do that. It's, it's okay. Well, especially because like, you know, in the first movie, some of the scientists, uh, Sigourney Weaver's character passed away and became yes. part of the tribe. Mm -hmm. Um, what was his name? Sam Walt, not Walt, uh, What's what's the main character's name? Jake Sully. Jake Sully. Yeah. Sam Walton. I don't know. <laughs> uh, whatever. That's his actual. That's his, his real name. <laughs> Is that his real right? name? <laughs> it sounds yes. Close. Um, definitely not the part of the Walmart family. Um, no. <laughs> so I mean, they knew he was human and became an avatar. Like they, at the end of that movie, his conscience got moved from his body to the avatar. Yeah, basically it was, it was like some kind of miracle or something like right. he, he essentially was passing away if I recall correctly and they brought him to like the tree or whatever and they were doing their chanting and that yeah. sort of thing and then I think the last scene is a close up of his avatar's face and he actually wakes, you see his eyes open and that right. was it. And then you have like the one of the scientists who was Sigourney Weaver's yes. kind of aide who yeah. also became, so like there was humans who became part of this right. ne Navia, Nevia species or whatever they're called. Navid, I think. Navid. Um, and so you think some of the word, and at the, in the movie, like they're marching the humans back onto the ship, maybe to go back to earth or, yeah. or leave, right? Yeah, so yeah. you would think the word would get back to earth. Like it would be huge news. Like we found a planet that we can't breathe on yet, but you know, it has a lot of natural resources and it's paradise otherwise. Yeah. Um, and then things would have changed. And especially if we're desperate and we've learned from our mistakes in the past with like Native Americans, how we, you know, not even to go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, so you'd think that things would have changed for the second movie, but we almost got like regurgitated the same thing that happened in the first movie and the second movie and we just added water. Yeah, it's. I was a bit surprised that they brought the colonel back, and I'm actually, uh, it's, it's a double-edged sword for me in a, in a way because, first of all, I love the performance that uh, of like the colonel in the first movie. You know, like he he yeah. had screen presence. He's actually in the movie Tombstone. Is he? Blew my mind when I made the connection. But yes, he was the miner who was like a, one part of the bad guys. He had a beard, and. uh he, his name was Ike. I think mean, uh, it's been too long. He, he remember, remember he says uh, he was he was like the lap dog of like the the main villain with the red shirt and tombstone. But um, he he's he says he's like uh, it, it, like like when uh, when Wyatt Earp is gonna. Um, bring uh, whoever, I can't remember what the villain's name is, to, in, to, to jail, basically, to stand trial. He's like, set him loose. He's like, well, I'm not. He's like, I swear to God, if you don't turn him loose, we're going to tear you apart. And then uh, Wyatt Earp like, puts his gun right at his forehead, and he says, you die first, get it? Your friends may get me in a rush, but not before I turn your head into a canoe. Do you understand me? And he's, he's, that was that guy? Yes! He wore that blue sweaty shirt that collared shirt and uh like his friends is like yeah he's bluffing he's like no he's not 
I remember that person, he, but I, don't remember, I didn't think it was that actor. It was him. Hmm. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of the, of the actor. I, and, and again, like granted he's playing like, like just this very tropey colonel in avatar. But what I thought was interesting was the idea of bringing him back in the sequel First of all, I, I, my initial reaction was like, oh, we've already been here and done that, right? But at the same time, what was fascinating was now it was actually, it wasn't him because he his, his human form died on Pandora. He comes back as basically like, like, like this secret military project right. where they were able to download his memories and personality into this, you know, sure. avatar that they, that they genetically engineered. And so it was it was actually neat to see him go on this journey of like like discovering his dead body and like wanting to play back like the instant replay of his death and stuff and like I don't know I always find that sort of thing interesting. And so that side of it I thought okay well that that to me has some merit to it because I I, I was enjoying kind of the antagonist's journey in that regard where he was self-aware of the fact that he was no longer human. And he actually, the only way he is, he, he survived is that he's in this body of the very creatures he despises. Not only that, but then like he can tell, like he has like extra strength and like different abilities that he didn't have when he was a human. But at the same time, you can tell there, there is a part of him that feels remorse that feels like just, you know, wishes or almost like pines for like being human once again. But at least from what we're told, they just can't like, you know, generate another body for him or whatever. So right. I don't know. It, it, it was very interesting. And he had kind of like that Hamlet esque moment where like he's holding his own skull and he crushes it, you know? So things like that, I thought, weren't all like a waste, but at the same time, it's kind of like, well, what could have been placed in it, in it, you know, instead of going down this road, like sure. what could they have done? So I don't know. It, it is kind of interesting to think about. And again, I also like the, the idea of earth as a planet that's basically dying, mm -hmm. you know, that, cause I was wondering too, like, okay, if the, if the humans are coming back, the sky people, if they're coming back to Pandora, what is the motivation? It could be trying to get more of that, of that material, the unobtainium. <laughs> but see, the thing is, is like, once again, we've already explored that. So it'd be kind of boring for them to try and come back for it. Plus like the, uh, the, the natives were, were successful in kicking them out. Right. So it's like, okay, what are you going to do? So I also like that. I like that perspective, but it didn't make sense how they wanted to, I mean, if Earth was dying, what good would it be to make eighty million dollars on a dying planet? Yeah, you know, with the, with the the whale's cerebral fluid, right? So <clears throat> that and yes, it would be boring to go. Hey, we're coming back for more Optanium. Never found it the first go around. Maybe the second go around would be good. But you know, so okay, we replaced one rare material with another rare material, and uh, we still kind of have you know, the same movie. Um, but I think they focus too much also on, um, the, the army general mm -hmm. trying to get revenge on the protagonist from the, from the movie, Jake Sully, Jake Sully. Battle with name, Rose. Yeah. It's, it's a simple name to remember, Steve. <laughs> and, and so like, okay, that was the briefing in the beginning of the movie. About hey, we need to, you know we you know, the Earth's dying and we need to colonize this planet, which kind of still didn't make sense because how are they going to find an endless supply of air because they can't breathe on the planet? Are they going to evolve? Like what's the deal? Yeah, that was one of the the critiques that both my wife and I had as well, which is that this is not a one to one place where you can breathe the same amount of oxygen, yeah. and you know maybe suspension of disbelief could be that they have certain like oxygen generators, you know, like that can mm. recycle O2 or that maybe can, can create or generate more O2. This is in the future. This is not supposed to be present day. So there are certain advancements that are going on. So, but yeah, I mean, it was definitely something that we pointed out as like, but, uh, but then we answered our own kind of critique in a way where it's, which is like, okay, well, if earth is in fact dying, and the only option is Pandora. 
you're acting out of desperation as humanity at that point because it's like, well, we can't go to the moon. We can't really make crops on the moon. <laughs> you know, so like if Pandora was the only planet that, that was like somewhat inhabitable and you have no other option, you're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that humanity survives. And that's what I wanted to have James delve more into is like, I wanted there to be more of this, like identifiable need that the audience could get behind sure. where it's like, suddenly you, you do feel like it's a catch 22 or you're like, man, who, who do I root for? Because, you know, at the end of the day, we as humans, we also really want our own kind to survive, right? Sure. Like it's, it becomes more of a philosophical question, really. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of reminds me of like like that one of those those the standard questions they ask of like, okay, you got a raft, and there's only so many people that can fit in the raft, and so you're gonna have to push one person off. Who would you choose? And like, you know, the standard kind of initial response would be that, well, I don't want to push anybody off. Like sure. that's just terrible. But then you start going into like, okay, what are the basic necessities for survival? And you have to make those hard choices. Hard choices. If we could say, okay, Jake Sully, I got his name right that time. I'm proud of you, Steve. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> he would have to make the hard choice. Now that he's become part of the tribe, he has family, yeah. he's leading the resistance. Humans come back to him, you know, hats in hand going, look, the planet you were born on, your original race, yeah. we're dying. Okay, it wasn't all of our vote to come here and cause havoc. I wouldn't even say race. I would say just your species. Oh, your species. Yeah, sure. Um, and so we, you're, we're, we're, we're dying. We have to cohabitate. Co cohab cohabitate? Cohabitate. <laughs> co cohabitulatate. Uh, <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> Anyhow. Cohabitulate. <laughs> Habitual <laughs> Um, But anyhow, so everyone has to get along or we all die. Coexist. I think that's what you're talking about. Well, they're, they're kind of yes. habitating. Yes. Um, I like habitating with you. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since like the tribe is much more well armed than they were before. I mean, they just had like bows and arrows yeah. and luck on their side, maybe their size. And now they have pretty much all the, the human weapons because mm -hmm. they've been hijacking all these trains and supply lines. Right. And so they're much more of a you know, formidable force now than they were before. Plus they and obliterated the, the army. Right. And so they almost have no defenses. Um, so yes, that would have made a much more compelling story, but we didn't really have Jake Sully being like front and center. We had his kids being front and center. Which also kind of begs the question, like, hey, what audience is Avatar 2 really going for? Yeah. Because I wanted to see more of Jake Sully. I'm an older guy. You know, I'm not a father yet, but there's plenty of people my age who are fathers. Yeah, yeah. Um, who can identify with him. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we got. Um, yeah. And, and to touch on that point just a bit further, that was interesting, too, in the sense that I think... James Cameron was attempting to make this for a broad audience where like you could have kids go and watch it. You could have teenagers, you could have old folks, you could have parents. And so there was the, this kind of running ongoing theme of family, which I'm not against. I think, it, I, you know, that has its place for sure. sure but, but at the same time, like I do think here's, here's, I, I want to pivot a bit. What is it? So we were talking about the Colonel returning back in Avatar form. And even at the end of the movie, his son, who I, I, I don't even remember if his son was even in the first movie. Or no, they had that one behind it. That was swept well underneath the car. Okay, so that was like a, an Avatar part two only kind of thing. Okay. 1.5. So <laughs> we find out that he had a, a, a kid while he was there, but it was just a baby, so it couldn't go back to Earth. And so, again, there is kind of this duality, right? This parallel that's happening where we're seeing both the relationship that Jake Sully has with all of his children, but then you're also seeing this colonel who, who is realizing he has a son, and the, so there is that kinship that's there. There is that desire to bond, that sort of thing. 
And yet you have these two different places. And at the end of the movie, his son feels compelled because especially after his dad responded when um, Jake Sully's wife was going to kill him. And he's like, no, like, like it was in that instant that his son realized, Hey, my dad actually really does have feelings for me. Now, whether or not those feelings are parental in nature because he's the kid's dad, or if it's because he sees value in possibly being able to like use his son's DNA in the future. I don't, you know, that that's, that's kind of ambiguous, right? You don't really know. What I'm wanting to get at, though, is the son saves the dad at the end from drowning. Uh-huh. And so he he lives on to fight another day. Here's where I'm having a concern about Avatar. Is oh, all the way here then, right? Well, I think it's it's worth talking about just because they have already been working on Avatar 3, 4, and 5. And I think there's even 6 and 7 that's on the table. So... <sighs> I I don't want this to turn into this constant like colonel hunting Jake Sully and his family through like five to seven movies of Avatar. Like mm. yeah, the reason I bring this up is because we were talking about like, you know, ground that had already been covered. I think that's that, that has a danger of really getting old really fast. Like I I for one want to see more of the planet of Pandora. I want to see more of like the politics of the tribes, maybe there's some like, I don't know, different types of tribes that have some pretty evil chiefs and like folks who have like, maybe there's some infighting going on. Maybe there's some betrayals. I don't know. But like, I just, I feel as though if they're going to, if they're going to try and turn this Colonel into like the Darth Vader of Avatar, like I just, I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. The end, that choice at the end was just stupid, I think. <laughs> um, I mean, I we have no other antagonist but the colonel, the general, the admiral, the whatever colonel, he was. It's colonel, colonel, it's colonel, whatever he is. Um, Clearly, he paid a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so you see, even that this this kid, Spider, what I don't know what his real name was. Yeah. I can't remember that. Was. Yeah, don't worry about it. He's, he's witnessed his dad, like, decimate tribes and commit all these atrocities. He's like, that's yes. my dad. I want to save him. And I've had no relationship with, with him whatsoever. And I'm going to risk, you know, any, like, future genocide and save him just to see what happens. Well, not to mention the fact that he had been accepted into more of the Avatar's yeah. way of life. And for him to do that is such a betrayal uh, of their yeah. trust. And I'm like, wait, kid, let me get this straight. You have zero relationship with your father. You realize that your father is actually like behind some of the, like the worst types of ideas and missions and hunting and everything else. Not to mention the fact that like, you don't, there's no way for you to get off this planet. So if you piss off every one of those avatars who have like welcomed you into their tribes and trust you, where are you going to go? Right. What are you going to do? And I get it. Like they're trying, like James was trying to do this thing of, well, he's my dad. <laughs> I can't kill my own father, my own can't dad. Kill my dad. He's, he's got some issues. <laughs> who doesn't? <laughs> You know, I don't mean he has to die. I'm like, <laughs> dude, stop. Like, and, and again, it just, it trivializes. Gotta have sequels too. Well, it, it trivializes <laughs> that which came before it. Like, for instance, like with the Colonel returning, to a certain extent, I will say that it does trivialize um, the death that he had at the end of the first Avatar movie. It's like, cause that was like a big moment, right? It was like, he finally dies, but now we bring him back. It's like, Oh, okay. Well, he's not the same exactly. And like I said earlier, I do like some of what they were doing with it. Okay. That's not bad. But then they trivialize it further where it's like Jake Sully has like this drawn out fight with him, bests him and so it's like, oh, wow, okay, thank God, like, you know, that's over with, and, you know, now we can move on and see what else. And the kid goes in and saves the dead, which I'm like, dude, he would have been already drowned by then. Like, like, be, let's be real here. Like, Jake Sully already, like, injured the guy quite a bit, then drowned him, and he was laying on the bottom of the ocean for a while. Like, unconscious, water filling his lungs. Oh, yeah. Where there's a will, there's a way. He Russ. was he was twitching. His body was like <laughs> twitching. <laughs> <under there. laughs> now, granted, 
<laughs> he was not human. He was an avatar. So maybe, just maybe, they have some kind of other survivability that I am unaware of. No, Russ. You know, they, because his breed of avatar uh, was land going, not water going. And so when Jake Sully and family arrived, they were having to like train. Huh? They had to train. They had to train. Yeah. Exactly. They were, tra- they, they had to. <laughs> not a choo choo train by Pretty much learn to swim, learn to ride the. Fishes the fish animals instead that was of like pretty cool. By the it way. was cool. Um, hold their breath longer. Yeah, you know. So and they had been doing that for who knows how long. I mean, all real Jake really had to do was just say, "Who can hold your breath the longest?" You know, and then pretty much drown. I mean, it really didn't have to be a fight. You know what else kind of was stupid around that scene, Russ? <laughs> what? So the ship is sinking, stupid like the Titanic, old. and. You know, it's blowing up and there's, it did have some, some Titanic vibes there and there's fire everywhere. And for some reason, like, you know, fire is not going to exist within the water. It exists on the surface. Like you have oil or gas on the surface of the water. Yes, it can, it can ignite. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's not going to go beneath the water. And so all they really had to do was hold their breath for like a minute, 30 seconds and swim underneath. And they wouldn't have had to be on the sinking ship. Mm-hmm. But they all found the maze into the <laughs> furthest corridor inside. And they're like, okay, we're here. Now we got to find a way out. You know, and then the water people, <laughs> <laughs> the water people were like, okay, yep, yeah, we helped you fight. We're out. Yeah, save yourselves or anything. They were like gone and like just not even around. I don't know. The whole ending, like, I just kind of I slapped together. You know, when, when the when the ending had that moment of the ship starting to roll over and whatnot, I'm like, man, this is this is like totally Titanic all over again. I like I kinda halfway expected to see, you know, Kate Winslet floating on a piece of ship and saying, I'll never let go, Jack. <laughs> yeah. There's gonna be like, like a comedy coming out or something. Like, you know, and that's just gonna be I think Kate Winslet was in this movie though. Was she was, but I don't know which character. I probably couldn't pronounce it anyway. Was it, was she, did she play Sigourney? We, I want to say she either played Sigourney Weaver's daughter or she played maybe one of the water, like the, like the daughter of the water tribe. Sigourney Weaver played Sigourney Weaver's daughter. She did? Yes. You know that for sure? M. Dib. Which was odd to me because like Sigourney Weaver, there's nothing wrong with Sigourney Weaver. Love Sigourney Weaver in a bunch of movies. Oh, she's great. But like she has a very mature woman's voice now because she's aged and matured and she's put into a body of a teenager. And the voice was completely like misplaced in my opinion. Like there was times like you sound like you're a loving grandmother and you're like 13 years old. And you're 13 years old. (laughs) It's... You know what else happened towards the end was the whaler people, the whaler puffer fish turtle pe- things that they were hunting. Ah, uh, yeah, the Australians. Yeah. Oh, we're gonna hey, watch this. We're gonna hop in. It's really quite a sight <laughs> to see. Steve Owen would be rolling over yeah. his grave if he saw us like this. Steve Owen. Yeah, <laughs> just ir- irony that we're from Australia too. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Nothing but southern rednecks and Australians on Pandora. See how you hot pin them like that? Yeah, I really don't <laughs> like it, do you? Ah, see how his eye twitches? Yeah, ain't that funny? Watch like, his eye harpoon him right up his ass. <laughs> oh, he's really pissed now. He's like, look how he's tugging on it. Oh, we're, we're going through the water full reverse. <laughs> oh, gosh. So, like, the, the last battle is happening and people are dying. They're getting impaled. They're getting shot. They're drowning. And they're like, Oh, get the whale, get the whale. Like you think you would probably run for your lives. Like, okay, I can make 80 million right now on a dying planet or die right now. in the most violent way possible. Mm. I like those odds. You're like, yeah, 50, 50, let's just go for it. You know, <laughs> swarm the battlefield, everybody. <laughs> Too much, Russ. Too much. Too much. Well, what Kate in the friggin' A is happening. I looked up here. I want to say that, yeah, she did play. She either played. Oh, I have something in my eyeball. Oh, I'm going to switch back to you, dude. I gotta, I'm supposed to do a song and dance right now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I have an eyelash in my eye. It's like stabbing me. 
That's fascinating. Uh, that is goodness. absolutely fascinating. Oh my goodness gracious here. Anyway, she plays either the wife of the water chief or she plays the daughter. I, I don't think I don't she don't. played though. Yeah, no. I think she probably played the wife. Mm. Mm-mm. Yeah, I'm looking at the pictures. That's who she played. Case closed, Steve. Mm. Case closed. The wife was like, hissing and, and growling way too much. <laughs> I wait, Sigourney Weaver. Dude, the, the, the girl's what? voice was exactly Sigourney Weaver's. No, I'm saying Kate Winslet. Oh, Kate Winslet. Yeah. I thought you were mad and Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. Kate Winslet. Well, yeah. kudos yeah. to Kate. <sighs> what I do think is worthy of merit is the fact that um, a lot of the CG that we saw particularly the various types of vehicles and vessels that the humans had were really cool. They were the, the engineering, like I really appreciated the thoughtfulness behind, like for instance, those those, like crab looking things that they, you know, the the people would get into and then you'd see them walk kind of sideways like a crab and they had like those little kind of claw esque looking things they could use. That looks really cool, in my opinion. I really bought into that. Everything, like the functionality of how you, like they would get in there and they would close down the hatch and like how they, you know, even like when they would get in the water, how like they would kind of tuck in all their stuff and make themselves a bit more aerodynamic as they're going through the water and then they can, you know, reach out and do different things. I love that. I love the little uh, uh, mini submarines, you know, those, uh, sub, what do they call them? Like submersibles or whatever? Sure, Russ. Sure. I don't know. But I really like that. How it's like a two man crew and they go down and, and they go in. A lot of that, it wasn't cheesy to me. It wasn't something where like I didn't believe in it. I think because you could tell that there was a lot of thought that was placed into, okay, if we were to have something that really did exist like this, how would it move? How would it operate? How would it function? What are the various types of abilities that would be helpful if you were more in this like aquatic environment, that sort of thing? Did you also get a kick out of those? I did, actually. Um, I I remember thinking in the theater, I wonder how James Cameron decided to make this stuff or how he was designing it because we're supposed to hate the the humans in the movie and yet they have some pretty cool stuff, which makes me kind of like them. Um, well, and I don't think we're supposed to hate all the humans. I think, I think there are certain ones that we're definitely not supposed to root for, but I do think like, for instance, the there was that, that, uh, biochemist that was on the boat with uh, the Australians and like his whole thing was like, he, he wanted to learn more about the aquatic alien species on Pandora, but he was willing to turn a blind eye to the atrocities right. that they were doing. So, kind of a gray area in there. And, and you, you know, as, as an audience viewer, you're watching this guy and you're like, okay, well he's you know. not, <laughs> his heart is not as blackened as like the, the captain, but at the same time, it's like, dude, you're like, with the team. Yeah, buddy. It's like, kind of like accessible to murder kind of thing. I don't know. Accessory. Guilty by association. Uh, but again, those are things that I do appreciate because then that creates more of that complexity, right? It's kind of like, okay, well, you have different humans that are there for different reasons. And the folks who we never get to know, like just basically the extras and, you know, people who are manning the boat and that sort of thing. Those are folks who maybe we can make up certain things. Like maybe they have a family back on earth where like they're depending on the paycheck or maybe like they've worked out a contract deal where because they're helping the military get established with the city and stuff that their family or is one of the first ones off the planet, certain things like that. Now, again, if they were to actually explore that, mm. that's where I think more of the sympathy comes in. But then that, that mm. means that there's more work creatively from a narrative perspective for James Cameron and his crew to do where it's like, okay, if we were to introduce these things, suddenly it's not so black and white. It's not so cut and dry. Mm. It's kind of like, Oh Mm. yeah, that's hard. Russ, we'd rather just let people ride whales. Indeed. Those whales are cool looking. Yeah. Um, we're supposed to believe that they make music and they're philosophical too. Mm -hmm. Mm. Poetic. Wow, they're poetic. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> I think he's hungry. <laughs> that's a song. <laughs> no, you're lonely. 
<laughs> no, no. It's what? very sad. There's that, that that one funny Brian Regan thing that he said one time. He was talking about watching one of those like uh, documentary shows, and like it's the one on whaling, and you see the guy recording it. It's like, mm, I think he's lonely. <laughs> no, you're lonely. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. That's not an eye roll moment. What else, Steve, do you have to say about the film? You know what I hope they, I wish, hope, hope is lost, Russ. I wish they would have done is, um, so you have like the, you know, both tribes meeting each other and both have strengths and weaknesses. And yeah, we're supposed to buy into like the, the water tribe, but it would have been cool instead of going like, oh, you know, there's bullies and we got to you know make relationships. We get into trouble and which I think has been done many times. But if there was some stuff happening in the water and then some stuff happening in the woods so they can go like, okay, yeah, like your body structure with the thinner tails and like the longer, thinner arm, that makes total sense. Like there's nothing we can do. We are a lot slower than you. And they would respect like the abilities of the, the tribe we've come to know. Um, but we didn't really get that. They're like, oh, you're just the weaker guys and we're going to be you know, front and center. And I, I wish they would have had, you know, Jake's, Jake, I'm going back to him. He was like, I appreciated the the father and is, is protector of the family. I love that. Show me more of it. But they didn't. And it was more like him lecturing the kids mm-hmm. all the time. And the kids were not bad kids. They were always trying to be um, good or be the hero. Well, there was some machismo in there, there machismo, from the younger sure. brother. I mean, they're basically at that funky teenage sure. age where they're not an adult yet, but they're not a kid. They have sure. just enough independence where they can get into trouble and do things. And the thing is, is that Jake Sully, you have to remember, Jake Sully voluntarily stopped being chief of his own tribe in the forest simply because right. it was putting the forest at danger because the colonel was trying to figure out where he was. So he did that as a means to save the tribe, but then he basically exiled his entire family. So he's got that pressure on his shoulders. I get it. He then goes to the, the water people and Puts the water them in danger. Exactly. Well, again, like <laughs> I think I personally didn't have a problem with any of that. I actually like that because when you're going from one tribe to another and not only that, but you're also going from one habitat to another and you clearly are not genetically designed for that environment you're going to feel self-conscious. You're going to feel vulnerable. You're going to feel like, okay, how do I pitch in in a a tribe or village like this when I can't do a whole lot, but at the same time, I can't go back that way. So what do you do? So again, those are things where like, you know, I enjoy where they, they decide to explore what desperation does to a person. I can see that, but again, I don't think they did enough with it because the, all the camera time that we had was mostly him saying, I'm sorry to the chieftain and, and like, you know, come with me, you know, you're messing up again. You're, you know, disrespecting here. You're, you're causing, you know, dishonoring the family sort of thing. And like, okay, I can grant you that maybe once or twice, but that that's all you're giving us. It's getting boring. Like I need him to be like, saving the day or something or showing his kids how it's done or standing up to the chieftain or like commanding more respect than just like, I'm your father. I tell you what to do. Well, and I think it's, it it was more complicated than that. Be just because you're in this other village that is not your own. I know you're trying to pull your weight. And then on top of that, like your kids and, and the younger son was kind of the troublemaker, right? Like we, that gets established even before they get there. And then on top of that, that becomes a, a running theme that comes to bite him later on when his older brother dies. Basically, it was his fault. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just the kid trying to do right. It was the kid's ego getting in the way and his kid. But it, and again, it wasn't 100 percent that either. But like there was this this conflict which made his character actually interesting as a son where it's like, you know, I, I myself could empathize with that character where he's not being listened to when he's telling the truth. But at the same time, also as a parent, I know that like sometimes kids make poor decisions. They do really dumb stuff and not so much. Do you want to discipline them in front of other mixed company? And so like, you got to do what you got to do. But like, that was part of the challenge too, is that you had all these different characters that were being introduced from these two families 
And so Jake Sully's character, because he was already kind of defined in the first film, he, I wouldn't say he took a backseat per se, but like they really had to make room. And I think that's part, partly why the, the film was so long was like, you had probably like what, three or four kids of his, and then another like three or four kids from the water folk that you really had to flesh out. I mean, like, and I found myself not even liking <clears throat> Um, the brothers on the on the water side. I mean, I thought that there were a couple of punks at first. You know, the daughter was like the only redeemable sibling out of the out of the bunch, and then they finally came to an understanding. But I mean, there was some real danger, which you know, again, all Jake wants is to have harmony and Peace. and I just fly it. under the radar kind of stuff. So it's like I don't I don't see him flying off the chain and like doing crazy amounts of stuff. Not to mention. Jake Sully himself is also having to learn how to do these different types of underwater skills. I get that. Think, think of like, <clears throat> this is probably gonna be a bad example, but, <laughs> but it, it makes sense. Okay. Totally separate movie. Ninja turtles. Ah, the four, the four turtles and splinter. Now uh -huh. splinter raised the turtles from kid, or the kids. They're flying underneath the radar. He's teaching them ways. He's teaching them manners, teaching them respect, teaching them how to fight. When they mess up, he he disciplines, but he turns that into a learning experience, becomes philosophical, and you remember it, right? You're like, as a viewer, you're watching and going, yes, that's something I can, that's a lesson I can learn in my own life. I mean, I'm not a turtle, I'm not a rat, I'm not a mutant, but I mean, what he's saying is what a father would, would say to his kid, right? And then Splinter has times where he's kicking butt too. So you're like, yeah, Splinter, I have respect for you too, sort Gosh. of thing. And so that's what I, I kind of mean. So, but if it was like the Ninja Turtles where all Splinter was doing or all that we saw Splinter doing is just disciplining the turtles and just sitting there with his cane and his robe. Oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't, it, that's, it just gets monotonous to me. It gets boring. I want to see more. I, I'm supposed to be entertained mm -hmm. and I want to see more. So it's not like what they did was bad per se. It's just, again, part of the storytelling that they could have done more with if they if they took away from more of the, isn't this world beautiful? Let's go through a skyscape. Let's go underwater. Let's see all these fish and whales and creatures and stuff. And if they take some part of that away, delved more into the story, I think it could have paid dividends. Well, and I think too because they have all these other films already greenlit and in production, I think they're having to like pace themselves in such a way where I don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm not on the inside track of this kind of thing. Yes, you are. Um, Russ. But I, yeah, I, I just think, I do think that there is a reason why they have invested as much time as they did with like the kids, with the siblings. I don't know if the parents are necessarily going to survive through all five or seven avatars. I have no idea, but I do think that, that there was a bit of a struggle there because they wanted to, they definitely wanted to explore the idea of placing Jake Sully in this vulnerable position where everything is basically stripped away from him but all he has is family and how family is actually really the most important thing that matters in life anyway. Mm. But there, and you know, there were certain sacrifices. Like for instance, when you, when we talked about how the younger brother was kind of a troublemaker, right? He was always making poor decisions that ends up getting his older brother killed, who was basically arguably the favorite, right? Like he was the one who did do all the right things, who made all the right decisions, who was like this glowing example and so now that that was one of the sacrificial lambs that occurred in the film, now this younger brother is having to step up and that's a maturing process. Whether or not that captivates the audience in the future remains to be seen. But mm -hmm. like, I, I, I really enjoyed the daughter from the, the water tribe. I thought she was just lovely and, and welcoming and intelligent and sure. all that. I'd like the idea about how like you, between the two tribes, like there was kind of like that, like infatuation with each other kind of thing. You're the young love. That mixing of the races, Russ. Yes, it's species, Steve. Species. <laughs> but um, anyway, oh. it was, I don't know, it, it, the film definitely was designed to leave on a bit of a cliff, not necessarily a cliffhanger, but like, obviously there's a whole lot more that they want to tell. Hmm. I just don't know what the appetite is going to be for the sequels. Hmm. And as of this recording, I looked and the film has made over $1 billion globally. 
Yeah. What's interesting is that they do enjoy focusing on that global number. They they haven't really been focusing they too much do, on right? the domestic mm. number. And I think the like this little past weekend it made like thirty five mil, mm. which I mean it's no slouch, but at the same time. When I think of a sequel to one of the, the biggest grossing films of all time, I would expect that number to be much higher. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm. <clears throat> hmm. Why don't you give your closing thoughts and dare I say rating, Steve? Russ, Russ um, just like the last movie, I walked out of the theater thinking it's a special effects fest, but... Um, I ain't going to see it again, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. Um, so I walked into this one, and it's basically the same thing. I don't plan on seeing it again. Uh, if you like special effects, go see it. I mean, there's plenty of movies that um, you can also see for special effects. I think that would give you better entertainment than this one. This one technically is far and above yes. the best. Mm-hmm. Um you know what? Let me say one more thing, Russ. You know what oh. it kind of reminded me of? Oh! You're probably going to laugh at me. But I remember when Lucas, George Lucas, uh-huh. made the prequels. Sure. Now, he had a lot of time, and he had a lot of fans, and he had a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But the prequels were not nearly as good as, like, the original trilogy. Right. And, it, and people were wondering, like, why? You had everything at your disposal. Well, how could you have made this not as good? And I think, think, Russ, propose that, most have heard. that this is what happens when you, when you give, like, a director free will to do, like, whatever and no criticism whatsoever. And it reminds me of... of what happened in this movie too, because they had a ton of time to make this. Edie Falco, who was like the one of the admirals in, in space, she was the one who was like punching the yeah. the thing. There's an interview with her where like she goes, Oh, I thought this movie came out already because they had already filmed it in I like heard 2014. About that. Yeah. And she's like, I thought it already came out and I never heard anything. I thought it didn't do well. Um <laughs> <laughs> that was an oopsie daisy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but anyhow. So he, I, I think Cameron had the budget he wanted, the time that he wanted, and since he his name is big in, in Hollywood, no one went to go criticize him. And if you did, um, he would you know probably treat you like he does some of the fans on his other work, mm-hmm. which has not been good. And so I I put that towards this movie, and I think yeah, I think that makes a, a little bit more sense. Where if people were critical saying. I think the story should be twisted this this way to go less on special effects, more on story. It would be even bigger and it wouldn't just be like a special effects movie and that's it. It would actually have some weight to it and people would be, you know, talking about how that, you know, they can identify with the characters and, you know, maybe explore what we're going through here on, on Earth with the minerals that we have with oil and making the oceans clean and, you know, whatever and whatnot. And instead, like, no one's talking about anything except for the special effects, and that's it. And I don't think that's really a legacy that will will last a very long time. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyhow, I didn't really, I didn't feel good at when I left the theater. I just felt bloated, honestly. I, I couldn't wait Probably from all that salted popcorn. Yeah, there's Dave. I did have a lot. We actually went to the theater. We're like, well, we were like, well, should we get a small thing? We're like, well, it's three hours long. Like, let's get the big one. And it was a big, large. I mean. I couldn't finish it, but I was exhausted when I left that theater. Like I just didn't, I didn't feel good at all. I can watch a three hour movie. No problem. Lord of the Rings, seen it many, many times. Three hour movie, epic on every level. I I just can't do it with this one. Um, So not for me. Um, I'm going to say, I'm I'm, going to give it a two, Russ. I thought you were going to give it a one. I'm going to give it a two. Two stars from this man to my left, a.k.a. Mm. your right. I don't know. I assume you're going to be higher. Russ. I am thinking about it. I think I probably will be. You know, so the, the like, as you were talking about, the, yeah. the visual bar has been set once again. I think mm. there is so much going on under the hood that I, for one, can appreciate 
just Myra. from a CG perspective that mm. uh, laymen such as yourself under the bonnet have no idea how much work goes into that. Yeah, it takes twenty minutes. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I for one really liked the the realism. Um, despite, like I said, the fact that like the actual avatars themselves mm. are very stylized. Yeah, right. I also, I really appreciate the fact that they left the forest, that they actually went to um, this other part of the planet where they themselves felt like a fish out of water. Oh, but then we, it also provided an opportunity for us to learn more about like a, another type of tribe that exists on the planet yes. of Pandora. So I thought that was really cool. Real, very refreshing. The story itself, I agree to a certain extent with you in the sense that it's not going to, you know, it didn't wow me. It's it's not something that pushes the bar anywhere. You know, I do think it, it, there were there were parts that were a bit heavy handed, mm. felt a bit like, uh, you know, go out and hug a tree, hippie kind of stuff that you'd see mm. from like the 70s, which you know, it kind of makes sense because James Cameron's heyday was more or less the seventies. And so for someone like me, like that doesn't necessarily resonate as much. It could totally resonate with other types of moviegoers where, you know, maybe that's a passion of theirs or something like that. But I just, I, I think the, the story overall is pretty forgettable and I'm, I just don't know where they're going to go. I think that in terms of, the sequels, they need to bring something new and captivating to the table. Yes, the visuals will always be one of those things, but you can't just have special effects by themselves carry the load. You have to actually have very interesting characters. And I, I like I said, I you know I'd like the Water Chief. I thought that was a neat character. I like the Water sure, Chief's Water daughter. Chiefs. I think uh, Jake Sully is interesting. I like his wife. His wife's his wife is spicy. Yes. I like, yes. I like his wife. So do you, you know, you definitely, and, and the performances, like the acting performances were really good. Like I didn't have a problem. I didn't find any acting to be subpar or whatever. Again, I think the weak link is in fact the story. It, they, it, it is just, it's a very high level, very like predictable. We very tread upon story that we've seen time and time again. <laughs> And I just think that there there needs to be more of an emphasis on like how do we be get how do we get more thoughtful with the narrative in a way that actually can stand shoulder to shoulder with the visuals because then that at that point it's like wow this is, this is something that is truly a spectacle so I would I would probably give Avatar the Way of Water drumroll please um uh, what do you give it Russ. Give it a... Say it. Taking too much time. There's a number in your head, Russ. Just spit it out. You know, I would probably give it three stars. Three stars for Avatar The Way of Water. I do think that people, you know, if you're looking for a film to go check out during the holiday break... There really aren't like a ton of, of films that are out at the moment. And I do think that this mm. is more or less, uh, you know, a family ish type of film. Maybe not for the youngsters, but like, you know, oh. if you got some 13 year olds and up or whatever, or maybe some, some 10 year old, 10 year olds and up or whatever. Um, you know, I think that again, you can tell there were broad strokes in an effort to be able to appeal to more of like a, a family broad audience. Speaking of family and broad audiences, Russ, there was a family sitting right next to me who had their toddlers. We're talking diapers and hardly can uh, speak English. Watching it right next to me. Ah, da, da, da. That's, I, I, maybe they're, I'm not there yet. Maybe the parents are just desperate to have a date. Mm. Maybe. I don't know, but really? We, we had the same thing too, actually. When we went to the theater, we we heard some little ones, some some toddlers or babies uh behind us somewhere. And I was thinking, wow, you're you brought them to this, huh? <laughs> hmm. Unfortunately, that's nothing new, Steve. That's been going on now for quite some wow. time. Wow. Well, that wraps up this episode of Joygasm. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm where you can enjoy exclusive perks 
and early access to the show, not to mention it continues financially helping us do the program. Also, make sure you click on that subscribe button as well as that notification bell. That way you will not miss a single solitary episode of Joygasm that drops once a week each week. And while you're at it, you could do a search on your favorite social media platform of choice for at Joygasm TV. Mm. Last but not least, you could also do a search for at Joygasm TV on Twitch to see us stream our gaming adventures live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. We can't wait for you to all to join us once more next week when we give our top five favorite games of 2022. We'll see you then. <laughs>